Today is actually a news heavy day because you have plenty of stocks to talk about. So let's not waste any time and get straight to our research team. Kotak Mahindra Bank uh, will be under pressure today, of course, for obvious reasons. But Abhishek is here uh, to, you know, give us a lowdown of all that happened in the last uh, 12 hours. Abhishek, over to you. Uh, well, RBI has taken action against uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank, Sonia. So, RBI asked Kotak Mahindra Bank to stop issuing new credit cards as well as onboarding new customers on its online as well as digital uh, platform or digital banking app. So, RBI has observed uh, serious deficiencies and non-compliances uh, uh, that they have observed in Kotak Mahindra Bank. Areas of IT inventory management, data security and a whole list of area has been actually mentioned by RBI in its release. Uh, bank is found to be materially deficient in building necessary operational resilience uh, due to failure in its IT system and the control. So credit card portfolio, if I take a look uh, as per the Q3 FI24 numbers, uh, the bank grew that book by 52% YOY and about 10% sequentially. One of the most profitable business is the credit card business for banks. Uh, and uh, the total book stood at about 13,880 crore, which formed about 3.9% of the loans. So a strong growing segment as well as uh, you know high margin business gets impacted uh, from RBI's diktat back to you okay all right Abhishek thanks a lot uh, for that well let's focus on a number that came in post market as uh, Manglam joins us to tell us about Hindustan Unilever Manglam well, the street wasn't expecting too much from Hindustan Unilever this time around, and the company did not disappoint them by not delivering too much as well. So if you just take a look at the revenue, the EBITDA, the volume growth, and the net profit, they were absolutely in line with what the street's uh, muted expectations were. Just 2% volume growth, a mild decline in the revenue, and the net profit a little above that 2400 crore mark. Uh, in the segments, the beauty and personal care segment actually saw a decline of 3%, as against street expectations of 1% to 2% growth, but that was offset by price growth in their food and refreshment segment which saw a revenue growth of 3% as against an expectation of just 1% growth and this was largely led by hikes in coffee prices. The gross margins of the company, they increased by about 300 basis points but that did not reflect in the EBITDA margins which declined by 20 basis points and that's largely because of a couple of factors. One, they increased their ad spends by about 200 basis points. The deal with GSK that got terminated took away about 60 basis points and also the royalty increase to the parent took away about 35 to 40 basis points. The management said they saw gradual recovery in rural. The parts of the business that are doing well are the ones that are doing well for everyone. That's premium, beauty and personal care as well as modern trade channels and they expect low single digit price decline going forward. The stock hasn't done much, but on these results, there's no reason to either buy or sell. So maybe a mild green at best for HUL. All right, uh, Mangalam, thanks very much uh, for that. That's HUL in focus. Now, uh, Kotak is the drag on Bank Nifty today, but uh, could Axis be the lift? Uh, Abhishek is here with details on that one. Abhishek, morning. Morning, Prashant. So, Axis Bank could be the, uh, you know, stock of the day. Beautiful Q4 FI24 from them. Records galore over there. Gross NP ratio is the lowest in last 34 quarters. Net NP ratio is the lowest in last 35 quarters. Now, net interest margin was expected to decline as per analyst estimate anywhere between 8 to 10 basis points. And, uh, you know, despite uh, CD ratio declining for them, the net interest margin has actually improved by 5 basis points overall for the bank, led by the fact that 8 basis point improvement was was seen in their domestic net interest margin. ROA has touched 2% for the first time that I am seeing in last 9 years. ROE has touched 20% uh, plus uh, for the first time that I am seeing in 9 years. Uh, so, annualized slippage ratio is at 1.44%, lowest in last 14 quarters. Analysts were estimating, uh, you know, slippages uh, to be in the range of 3,750 to, uh, you know, 4,300 crore, but it has come in a little more than 3,400 crore. CASA ratio has improved for the first time in last three to four quarters. PNL, both the NIA and PAT is ahead of our poll. Other income has also aided the PAT this time around. Back to you. All right, got that. Thanks a lot. Reema is with us to tell us about LTI Mind Tree. Reema, how did it look? Well, it's disappointing. Revenues and margins have come in lower than street expectations. The company's revenues on a constant currency basis, it's declined by 1.3%. The street was anticipating a decline, but not to this extent. Margins too have fallen for the third consecutive quarter and come in at 14.7%, dropping by 70 basis points on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis and lower than street expectation. In the conference call yesterday, the company did say they will return to growth in Q1. Q4 was an aberration. There is no change in... 
you know, the discretionary spending, there is still a lot of caution. And even on margins, uh, because margins have been disappointing, you know, for the company, they're talking about a gradual uptake in margins. Nomura has lowered the, you know, EPS estimates by 4 to 8 percent. Morgan Stanley has cut the target price to 4,600 post this disappointment. Okay, Rima, thanks for that. Well, uh, Mangalam, coming back to you, Indian hotels, numbers look good? Very good numbers uh, this time around. And this is seasonally not even a, a strong quarter, but despite that, the company has reported the best ever fourth quarter. Margins expanded on operating leverage. All the thesis that, uh, you know, one expects from the hospitality industry are now playing out. And the new businesses that the company has seeded has grown at two times the company's overall average. So revenue growth of 17% has actually led to a 23% jump in their EBITDA. 660 crores what the company has reported. And the net profit has jumped by about 29%. We're looking at a number closer to 440 crores. Occupancy for the year was 75%, which compares to 71%. Average room rates increased by about 7% to around 12,600 as well, with management fee revenue coming in at 468 crores. The company is also given a strong FI25 guidance with double-digit revenue growth likely, with new businesses being about 30% of their sales, and they will open 25 hotels in FI25. So all of this should bode well for the stock, despite the big run-up that we've already seen. In fact, we will be connecting with the management of Indian hotels at 10.15 a.m. today to discuss more about their Q4 earnings. Do stay tuned in for that. But Dalmia Bharat is the other one that you're looking at. Well, disappointing numbers, uh, Sonia. You know, the stock ended actually at the low point of the day in yesterday's trading session. So the street was sense sniffing that maybe the numbers will not be too good. And as I mentioned earlier, the stock has corrected 20% from its 52-week high. The revenue, that was a little bit better. Why was that? Because volumes were better. Now, the volumes... As in all probability, have come in better because of that uh, deal that they have with JPA. You know, so the tolling uh, volumes would be higher out there. But that's come at the cost of margins because margins have seen a sharp decline. We were expecting more or less stable margins. So that was a bit of a, a, an issue. The profit number, though, lo looks better because of higher other income as well as lower tax. What's the reason for the margin miss? The key reason is realizations were down by 7 to 8%. The street was working with a contraction of around 4 to 5%. So higher contraction out there. Cost as well were higher. Fed costs were much higher. Other expenditure as well was higher. And if you're looking at the purchases, well, they were up, telling you that clearly those uh, that tolling deal has impacted the profitability out there. And the profit number, it looks better, but it's actually because of a couple of one-offs. So that explains why. I expect the stock to open up in the red, but from there, we'll have to see how it does. All right, Nigel, thanks very much uh, for that. So uh, we'll keep an eye out on that one. Dalmia Bharat, the open, and then, of course, what happens later, as Nigel pointed out. Now, AU Small Finance Bank and Mass Financial are the other two names we are focusing on. Back to Abhishek for those. Abhishek, uh, back to you. Uh, well, uh, AU Small Finance Bank could also be in red given the fact that net interest margin is at 15 quarter low. Uh, so, uh, net interest margin has come in at 5.1% versus 6.1% in the same quarter last year and about 5.5% in the previous quarter. Return ratios also continue to deplete. Both the ROA and ROE have declined both YOY as well as quarter on quarter. So, asset quality is the uh, highlight over here in terms of positivity. Gross NPA ratio is down 32 basis point on a sequential basis. Net NPA is is down about 13 basis points sequentially. In terms of the PNL, NI is below our poll. However, on account of robust other income, the PAT is uh, ahead of our poll. Mass financial consistency continues over here. They have been consistent uh, post their uh, listing. So disbursals are up 15% YOY and more than 5% sequentially. AU growth is strong at about 25.1% YOY and 4.7% sequentially. NI growth is robust at 39% YOY and about 11% quarter quarter rare instance to see you know the calculation does show that net interest margin might have improved both YOY and quarter on quarter for a lender uh, the part is up 22.7 percent YOY and about 9.1 percent sequentially the only flip in the result is the gross NP ratio which has aged up by two basis point on a sequential basis back to you all right thanks a lot for that let's hop across to Ekta now she's going to talk about Sinjin and why she's watching that one Ekta over to you Thanks for that. Well, uh, numbers, I'm watching Sinjin because of its Q4 performance. Multi-quarter high for margins. So that was the big positive for Sinjin, which came in at around 34 Percent, uh, the best that we've seen in around seven to eight quarters for the particular company. But what disappointed was a revenue decline in Q4. It declined by around 7.8% versus expectations of around a 5 to 6% growth. So I think that would probably be the key disappointment for Sinjin. Profit was up around 6 odd percent. The other thing which was actually positive for Sinjin was that there was a Q on Q recovery which the company had alluded to in the previous quarter. Revenue was up 7.4% Q on Q. Margins, like I mentioned, were at multi quarter highs and the profit was higher 
at around 188 odd crores. For FY24, revenue was up around 9 odd percent. They missed their guidance of a double digit growth in FY24. And all of this has taken place because of the slowdown in the US biotech funding space. And they are expecting a recovery to take place there. For FY25, the guidance is high single digits to low double digits with momentum building through the year. So that should be positive. EBITDA to be similar to FY24, which was around 29 percent, and profit in single digit growth. So based on uh, the pro revenue decline, I expect the stock to probably be in the red, but the margin uh, strength should probably offset the weakness. All right, uh, Ita, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, so keep an eye out on that one. Uh, now, Macro Tech Developers is the next one, uh, and uh, Sonal has got details here. Sonal, good morning. Good morning, Krishan. Well, we already got the operational up update in terms of pre-sales, but now the company has gone ahead in their quarter four numbers, given the outlook for FY25 as well. They are looking at sales of 17,500 crore rupees. That's the bookings. That's a 20% growth that they're expecting, which is in line with their earlier targets as well. Cash flows from projects is expected at 21,000 crore rupees, and net debt to equ equity is expected uh, to be around that 0.5 times mark, and they have raised funds via QIP as well. In FI24, they said price growth has been to the tune of 5%. They've done launches of 5 million square feet and handovers of 1,809 units. The net debt stands at 3,010 crore rupees. Uh, but additionally, as they've raised uh, some equity as well, that has added in terms of funds uh, to the tune of 3,300 crore rupees. Their cost of debt has also come down. The company says that Palava and Aparthani is set to deliver sales of 175 to 200 billion dollars in next three decades. That's 30 years so that's the kind of guidance that they've given in the investor presentation and margins of 50 percent from those projects jeffrey says overall growth and deleveraging part stays intact and that's why they're bullish on the stock okay i've heard of thane but i haven't heard of upper thane okay every every place uh, has a lower parel now you know there's there's a upper juhu as well now yeah <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know what that means, but there's an upper thani. I mean, I think it's uh, the uh, ingenuity of real estate developers, right? Yeah. I mean, that's branding. Yeah. I think I mean, it's the, you could you could juhu and then you add something to it or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, what is happening of, all across the upper bandra? No, I've seen a lot of. I maybe it'll be redo up bandra, no? Because <laughs> there's so much there so much of redo up in no, the no, it's, it's got no zinc to it. It's got to have something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. But bandra's bandra, old school, vintage. Yeah. Vintage. <laughs> vintage. Upper. Bandra doesn't need an upper bandra, to be honest. But all right, let's do a quick recap of all our top stocks and focus stocks with positive news flow. There's Hindustan Unilever, Axis Bank, Indian Hotels. MAS Financial and Macrotech Developers, well, stocks with negative news flow, Kotak Mahindra Bank, LTI Mindtree, Dalmia Bharat and AU Small Finance Bank, along with Sinjin. Uh, but let's find out what's happening in the world of commodities today. Manisha Gupta is joining in. Manisha, what's the latest there? Good morning. Morning, Sonia. Thank you for that. Well, we've seen some gain come back in case of commodities. So crude oil prices are back above $88 a barrel. This is because the U.S. inventories have seen a big withdrawal of 6.4 million barrels. Markets were anticipating a buildup of 1.5 million. So this is quite on the contrary and a big number at that. So that is what seems to be supporting markets. Uh, the street is also waiting for the U.S. GDP and the personal consumption expenditure data. That would give you cues about inflation and the rate cut cues going forward. So that is what the street is waiting for. But it's not just crude. There's a smart rebound that we are seeing in metals. So the gold and silver prices are back at around multi-week highs at least. Gold is back above 2300 and silver prices gain 2% overnight. Within metals, we are looking at copper holding its two-year highs. Iron ore prices have rebounded to a six-week highs as well. There is renewed demand from China and lower shipments in the month of April also seem to be supportive for many of these metals. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Manisha. Well, for the time being, we'll slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll be joined by Deepan Mehta, Director at Erexide Equities, for some fundamental stock research. Later on, we'll also be joined by Abhisar, Partner and uh, National Leader of Financial Services at EY India, to discuss RBI's action on Kotak Mahindra Bank. Stay tuned.